Uh, okay. I'll, I'll read it here. It says, I feel that Luke and Renee understand addictions and lust and are therefore qualified to counsel others. Since Luke once had a problem with lust, he is compassionate and can actually help. Do you agree that most Christians do more harm than good when trying to counsel people about overcoming lust or addictions? And we'll let Renee go first. Do I think they do more harm than good? Yeah, because most of the time they don't do anything except point a finger at you. Um, yeah, here's the thing. It's very rare you'll get practical advice, like actual discipleship or instruction for this. They'll just tell you, hold on one second. I'm trying to move some stuff around on my desk here. Um, what they'll usually tell you is uh, uh, just don't do it. Stay away from it. It's sin or whatever. It's like, uh, I'm kind of in bondage here because I get sick every time I don't shoot up. So I got some problems here. Let me show you uh, what happened for me with the heroin. Well, I kept going to a church, right? And because I was so devastated, they kept telling me I had to repent of my sin. Well, of course, to me, what I hear is you got to stop being an addict before you can be saved, which means I was lost, which means I lost hope. Right. Um, so what what actually happened was I got saved and I, I, I was sick, but ended up it was how it worked out. I, I ended up getting some kind of medical help that helped me physically deal with the physical let me say something here physical withdrawal is agony so you can't just tell a person oh just stop okay alcoholic just stop drinking and have dts and go into a seizure that's not how you you, you can't stop cold turkey you can kill someone and if they don't die they're going to feel like they're dying and probably use again anyway just to feel normal again so that's not an option. So unless you've been a junkie or you have some kind of treatment uh, degree or something, you probably shouldn't be dealing with this kind of stuff. But what I what I suggest for people, and I can get condemned all day long by the Christian community. I'm not sending you to secular people, but I'm sending you to people that deal with flesh. Because when you have addiction, it is mental, spiritual, and physical. And so your desire can be all, I mean, you can be dying to stop and your body will work against you. So I think you need to, to deal with these things holistically. If you have an addiction that causes physical withdrawal, such as alcohol or benzodiazepines or opiates or, or even a methamphetamine of some sort, you need medical help to get through that because, um, it's it's nice to say I've heard these testimonies where they say, oh, I was a heroin addict and then I woke up and I had no withdrawals. It was like a miracle. I, I don't know how that happens. I, I don't. I mean, good for you if it did happen. But I don't I don't know how anybody could have done that because I couldn't go 12 hours where it's before I started sweating and shaking and all that kind of stuff. So I would suggest your spirituality and other than that's not who you are. So if you can get saved and get medical assistance to help you through the withdrawal process of that, it'll help you while you're building yourself up in the Lord, while you're being discipled to give you the mental and spiritual strength so that when the physical symptoms have stopped, so that you've, you've gotten over that mountain, now you've got some time under your belt, your your body is not sick when you try to stop, and you know the consequence for going back into it. And that also is not who you are, so that you can continue your growth. So I am all for people getting help, physical help, because withdrawal comes from what? Flesh. Your body is used to getting a chemical. When it stops getting the chemical, it thinks something's wrong. And it, people are on the, uh, at the potential for suicide during this time because their brain is not getting enough serotonin and dopamine and epinephrine. And you can have all kinds of, of terrible mental breakdowns. And so I believe uh, if 
I believe in medication. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking medication for a flesh issue. If it's physical and it can help you physically to get through something, I would never condemn someone for that. And I think it's having your head in the clouds and to say or condemn someone that wants to get help for telling them they can get no medication help and telling them cold turkey, they got to stop this behavior. It's not realistic. You're setting them up for failure and hopelessness. So unless you um, have been in bondage to something severe like that or have a degree in it, I don't think you should be telling someone how to get out of an addiction if you don't actually know anything about it, honestly. And I think a lot of Christians just think it's as easy as stopping. It's willpower. It has nothing to do with willpower. Um, that's not the way to go. And as far as the lust thing, uh, you know, when we're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, you know, we've, we've got to recognize who God says we are in Christ. And I think the more you're confirmed who he says you are, it's a lot harder to get, go back into that behavior. And I also think it's important to find some men or women that keep you accountable to your own behavior. I think it's important to do some practical things like maybe block websites or uh, have a close relationship. If you're a man to have a couple of men in your life that hold you accountable. So if you feel yourself going, wanting to slip away and hide and do things in secret, that you've got somebody that you are held accountable to on a daily basis and you have to report to them and you have to tell them what your thoughts were, what you did about it. Uh, and if you start to get tempted to that, you're able to call them just like any addiction program would provide. So um, I am for uh, spiritual things being spiritual. I am all for our victory in Christ, but I'm also for being realistic about our physical expectations and the physical things that can get in the way of our progress. Uh, and somebody will turn those physical uh, failures into some kind of spiritual, like in it and inadequacy or something like you're a bad person. A addiction is physical also. And so it doesn't make you a bad person because you get sick and you want to stop feeling sick. Uh, so we need to, to address these things um, uh, wholeheartedly. But I think the church has dropped the ball. They have pointed the finger. They've showed no compassion. They want to blame you and tell you uh, uh, just stop. And that, that's just not realistic. It just isn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, um, Brother Jordan, I don't know. Um, uh, do you remember the question? Because I had to read it for you. You, didn't, you don't have it in front of you. Uh, you ready? Yeah, I remember it. Okay. Yeah. Right, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just to answer the question flat out, no, of course not. Like I said, Yacht Club Christians make others feel like crap that we definitely don't have the um, leadership and fellowship that we should have today. And the modern day America church has fostered an environment where it is almost shameful to talk about your sins because Sunday is all about putting on your best show, not putting the struggles of your life forward. Um, while I've never um, felt into a heavy drug addiction, I have been addicted to drugs through treatment of very severe mental illness and um, benzodiazepines, Xanax, that was a nightmare to come off. And then um, at the beginning of the year, when everything started going down with COVID and my neighborhood burning down, I got back on them. I've never abused them, but as most people know, with benzodiazepines, they continue to raise the level because it stops becoming effective. And you can't go more than a few hours without just feeling like crap. And as far as lust goes, um, it's just one of those things that is so deep and I, it's something that I've struggled with and, you know, it's, I'm not going to pretend that it's still not something that's in my flesh. It's definitely something that creeps up at times. It's something that can be easy to fall into. And it's like Renee said, there are programs out there to help you, you know, for example, like covenant eyes and all that. Um, it gets, 
it gets hard as long as the desire is still there, though. And that's where prayer and intervention comes in, because it's only when God starts to change those desires, because we're always going to desire sin. It's just who we are as sinful, fallen creatures. But because we have the Holy Spirit, we do have the ability to start to change those desires. For me, when it came to lust, um, it became less about just the physical sensations that you could get. Um, it became more about the rush, the actual change in your body chemistry. And um, when I was attending counseling, this is something I talked about because it can lead to serious, reckless decisions. Um, you just stop thinking clearly. And, um, you know, it starts off as simple as pornography uh, for most people, but it can escalate pretty quickly. And this is why we see such a rise in sex crimes and all these things, because people let it get carried away. It starts off, you know, innocent enough um, with intentions of this is just something I'm going to do. But then um, it, it that stops exciting you. So you have to continue to something more graphic. And then the visuals stop becoming enough. So it has to get physical and like all these things. It's just one after another. So that is why it's important to um, put an end to it as you can. Um, I'm going to speak to you guys as disciples. Again, not uh, compromisation or pushing legalism or maintaining your salvation. Uh, addictions of any kind are very real. Um, and it can produce a lot of shame in your Christian walk. It can destroy fellowship with God. It can make you feel like God is angry with you. And it's a very hard place to be because you can enjoy your addiction and you can't enjoy your fellowship with God. So you're just miserable all the time. And, you know, it leads into anxiety, depression, and all of that. And this is what I mean by the power of grace. When I was struggling, I mean, I when I was a Calvinist, like I said a couple of broadcasts ago, I was 18 to 21. And that's a young adult, you know, college age, you know, I'm being young and stupid. Yes, I was a born again Christian. There was no excuse for it. I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit. I'm definitely not encouraging anyone or giving anyone license to fall into that because it. I, I'm just telling you right now is a very, very destructive path to go down. But what I will say is, uh, sorry, someone texted me and now I just got so off track. I had such a good thought going. Um, Give me one second to regather my thoughts. That that right there, that's like ADHD. Like I just, <laughs> I just someone texted me. I lost my whole train of thought. I hope that was edifying enough. Um. Oh, grace. Thank goodness. Okay. So sorry. <laughs> so, um, you know, being young, stupid, and full of lust. Um, I fell into a lot of sexual temptations and. At that time, you know, I'm listening to all my favorite teachers, one of which was Paul Washer, and I just felt horrible. I'm like, what am I doing? Am I not saved? Am I not one of the elect? Like, why do I keep doing the things that I don't like to do? And um, people would be like, well, Paul asked that same question. And I'm like, well, there's a huge difference between me and Paul. I'm not sending letters all around the world and pushing Christianity. So Paul was definitely more of a saint than me. But it is a struggle that we all go through. Once I understood grace, that's when these strongholds and footholds started to fall off. Because it's only when we understand that we are completely forgiven, that we are completely redeemed, that we no longer have to worry about the consequences of our sin. And we can then place that focus on the power we have in Christ to overcome that. Okay, thank you, brother. Nice recovery from that little... Oh, cool. I know. That was rough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the writer uh, of the question, uh, this brother has provided with us with hundreds of questions, actually. He's been very, very diligent at producing and sending us questions. So I greatly appreciate it, brother. Uh, 
and, and he's also, as you know, from the question, uh, very uh, attentive and, and knowledgeable about CES, me, Renee, uh, the things that we've said over the years. Uh, so uh, he, he points out that Renee and I have certain experiences. How does he know? Well, because we, we've spoken about our, our lives. Uh, scriptures does say that we should confess our faults one to another. And uh, also we can use these um, times to uh, try to help others, knowing that they're not alone, that other people have gone through these same issues. Uh, so uh, just recently, uh, someone who hates CES and hates me, uh, made a, uh, criticized me that all oh, Luke's Luke talks publicly about his adulteries. Well, yeah, so sorry. I, the, we get questions about these subjects, then we answer the questions. And uh, I, uh, I've been saved since I was 36, so 34 years now. And the first 36 years and the last, I mean, the first 36 years and the last 34 years, there's really quite a contrast. You'd think, uh, you'd think I was a different person. Matter of fact, I had a, a party at my house a few years ago, and uh, one of my old friends from high school and college was there talking about the old days, what I was like, and how different I, I am. And Bible Jim was there, and he says he was trying to make my friend understand. He said, he says it's yeah, he's this this he's a different person. It seems like it's like. It's not natural. It's it's like supernatural, you know. He was trying to get the guy to, to think and and uh, say, "Hey, this change in Luke is a supernatural thing. It's it's, it's such a dramatic change." Now I know that um, when people get born again, that we're not um, identical. Uh, we we some of us change a lot suddenly. Some of us change a lot gradually. Some of us seem to not change much at all. Uh, how we advance in our spiritual growth and maturity and become productive or non-productive Christians, it's unique to each of us. So I'm not trying to impose my experience on everybody else as a, as a test for you, but uh, the Lord has changed me a lot over time. But one thing he did immediately was take away my uh, ability to uh, uh, be an adulterer. Uh, I had no issue with being an adulterer um, before I was saved um, because my marriage was bad and uh, uh, I, I wasn't a believer and I didn't think there's, I think I thought I was perfectly justified because the marriage was not uh, good and satisfying. So I would have these other relationships. But after I got saved, one of the things that it hit me immediately uh, was reading the scriptures when Paul talks about how when you lay with a, someone outside of your marriage, I think he mentioned with a prostitute, that you're, you're actually taking the Holy Spirit. Maybe someone can find the exact scripture. But what you're doing is you're, you're actually dragging God through this adulterous experience with you because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And that was such a profound... Um, concept to me that, that that scripture just totally convicted me that I, I could no longer be adulterous after I was saved. Uh, uh, and the, the same thing happened with drugs. Um, I, I grew up uh, in the 60s. I had the, the um, um, sex, drugs, rock and roll was our theme. Uh, and that's the way that we lived in my generation through high school and college. And uh, so uh, I did uh, start with one, you know, harmless drug, marijuana, and gradually thought, well, that didn't kill me. They told me that was really dangerous, and that, that they lied to me. So the next thing I would try, and the next thing, and then gradually advanced through the hierarchy of the drugs. And and uh, but after I got saved, I've never used any recreational drugs uh, uh, to that in that way again. It was really. Um, um, desires were, I didn't make an attempt to change. It's just that God changed my desires. And uh, 
so that's been my experience. And uh, maybe if someone can learn from that, say, now the question is, are we equipped to counsel people and people who haven't had these experience, are they unequipped to counsel people on these matters? And I, I would say it is probably true that if a person hasn't had certain experiences, it's not really um, very uh, valid or easy for them to relate to someone who's has these issues. Um, and that's why I believe in uh, counseling. I'm not a, a counselor by any means as far as like uh, trained in counseling, uh, uh, degrees in counseling. But the people who are, um, many times these people come from drug addictions or, or alcoholism, and they're the ones that, that go into that kind of counseling because they have the experience to understand the person's problem. They can relate to it. They're better equipped to, to help the other person get through it. So I do think that I don't want to say absolutely that someone who hasn't had the experience shouldn't counsel others. Um, the best counsel we can give anybody, uh, I gave to someone years ago who was a, a graphic a young man who was a graphic artist, and he'd never taken any drugs. Uh, and he was curious, thinking that maybe if he experimented with some drugs, it would enhance his, uh, his mind in thinking of how he could produce artwork. And I cautioned him against it. I said, you may think that that's, it's a harmless thing to do, but you're playing with fire, you're gambling. No one knows when they first take their first drink of alcohol or their first uh, experience in, in drugs. They don't know the end of the road, how it's going to be. Maybe you're somebody that could do it once or twice or even do it occasionally recreationally and you're not addicted. But maybe you're someone that once you get into it, it takes over your life and it ruins your life and takes everything from you. Uh, so uh, the best course for everyone is, let's not even uh, be tempted to experiment and try any of these things, even the first time. That would be my best advice. Um, all yeah, right. so that is a huge thing. Uh, I, I wanna say one more thing. We gotta remember when we started trying drugs or using drugs or alcohol, we were sober when we made that decision. Something was wrong before we started using. And so sometimes if we can get the spiritual, emotional, and mental help that we need, we won't turn to these things to self-medicate. And when Luke said, don't even try it the first time, that's absolutely true. Uh, the problem is uh, very few people become addicts because they partied a little bit. Uh, most of the time they self-medicate. So uh, if we can have comfort in the Lord, we won't turn to these things of the flesh to try to be relieved of the pain. And so, <clears throat> you know, uh, every one of us before we were addicts had issues uh, and we just buried those issues. And those are the things I believe God helps us through once we get past the physical symptoms of it and the physical pain of getting out of it or the habit of it uh because i think that we're all broken and and the good news is that is something god can get to the root of he can uh make you alive in him and you can leave the past behind and and all those things are not who you are or how god sees you anymore and condemnation does nothing to free you it, the devil is a liar and he will condemn a Christian. That is why in Romans it says there is no more condemnation for those who walk after the spirit, not the flesh. He's talking about those under the law. If you look at that whole thing, it's about works of the law and things of the flesh. So when you're not law focused, you won't feel condemned. You're walking in God's grace. And uh, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Luke just told you he had conviction about his adultery. That's a big difference. It's it's not right. It's not who you are. It doesn't please God. Condemnation is giving you so much shame that you can't even come to God. And that is wrong. We we that's not the kind of uh feeling we have uh once we're God's children. 